Yeah, barely. Okay. I won't talk too loud then. <laughs> Don't want to wake you up. All right, so uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I have uh, Robert Lee here who's going to be speaking on uh, industrial control systems. Um, I want to announce a few things, uh, some speaker changes. Um, in Breaking Cyber, we're going to um, swap out one of the talks. The 2 o'clock talk is going to be um, on, in, um, on track 4. It's uh, taking a chainsaw to AI. Um, and then at 5 o'clock, uh, there's going to be another CTR lab, uh, the Cyber Threat Response Clinic. Um, for those of you that didn't, weren't able to attend it, um, it'll be at 5 o'clock in, uh, in 4 also. Um, the mixer this evening um, starts at 6 p.m. You can pick up your drink tickets if you're going to attend um, right outside here at uh, the info desk. Um, just show your badge and uh, they'll mark you off the list and give you a ticket for a free drink or two. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if you've seen the kids running around in the Spartan suits. Um, if you're interested in uh, buying those, we're going to auction them off or you can just say here's some money. Um, and we're going to donate that money um, to the uh, groups in uh, Florida for the hurricane uh, recovery fund there. Um, so without further ado, Mr. Robert Lee. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. All right. Well, you got to be careful when getting introduced. They're talking about throwing money at kids walking in the hallway. So it's a weird conference to be at, but I'm glad to be here. Uh, so, uh, quick quick background for me. So, uh, Rob Lee, run a company called Drago. Started my career actually in the Air Force. Uh, spent some time here in San Antonio as well, which is cool. Uh, spent most of my career with the National Security Agency and built out a mission there, looking at the various state actors breaking into industrial sites. Uh, so a lot of my career has been informed by what threats are actually doing to our infrastructure and how to counter that and how to move the needle forward in security. Uh, so a lot of my talk today will be focused on kind of that threat aspect of industrial environments, but also since it's a keynote, that basically means that I just get to wax poetically after lunch and we can have some interaction and if you don't choose to interact, then I just keep talking and it gets weird and we really should have some interaction. So I will likely pause every major topic I introduce and hopefully have some Q&A and then do the next one. But uh, let's see, from an industrial perspective, let's just get a little poll of the audience, like, yeah, is that speaker that asked for hand raises? Yeah, I am. Uh, so how many of you are familiar with ICS, or Industrial Control Environments and Security? Yes, it's so much better than normal. Also, it makes sense in San Antonio and Texas. It's always easy. You go up somewhere else. I go to California, and I'm like, ICS. They're like, what the hell is ICS? I go to Texas, like, oil and gas. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Uh, so <laughs> it's usually a good community for industrial security. Industrial is a weird world in of itself. I kind of liken it to being everything that is IT plus physics. Uh, effectively is what ICS comes down to. We're starting to see a lot of debates nowadays as well on is Alexa inside of a chiller unit part of IIoT and it gets in this really weird part of the world where I would say no, like if it's not an industrial control system, I don't really care to protect your Alexa device, but please don't connect it to the internet and your SCADA system. Um, but uh, my talk today again is going to focus on the threat piece. What can we learn from threats that are actually taking place today and what are some recommendations that hopefully will help you take some more out of the talks uh, here this week or this, this next couple days not only in the infrastructure security track but also what are some lessons learned that you can apply in general enterprise security because uh, I think there are a lot of things that we're learning in industrial uh, that are new or, or very interesting I often hear that ICS security is 10 years behind IT security and that's true if you measure it again IT security, but actually ICS security is pretty far ahead in a lot of other aspects. Um, and some of the things that we're learning can set trends for what we have in, in enterprise as well. Um, as you notice on the slides, or lack thereof, I have an iPad and I'm just going to draw. For those of you, how many of you know the Little Bobby comic or the Skate Me book? Got a couple people, cool. So. I do write a weekly Sunday comic. I originally wrote a book called Skate of Me when I was in the military. It was a book for children and management to explain ICS. Uh, I am the writer of the comic. I am not the illustrator, but I'm going to draw anyway. So please don't expect it to be inspiring on any aspect. Mostly it's for me to keep track of my own thoughts. But here's your first big topic. First big topic on ICS security is we don't know our industrial threat landscape. And that's probably 
a big topic to bite into right after lunch, but I mean like nobody knows. And I often hear the discussions from somebody that talked to somebody that talked to somebody that knew once upon a time there was a cyber attack in Brazil and it took down the power grid and like that's not true. Like there's a lot of made up stories in our field that drive the discussion a lot further than the actual cases. So the other thing I often see is the little private circles of, well, I could tell you if you had a clearance. Like, oh, if you had a top secret SCI clearance, I could tell you about these cyber attacks. I, I built the mission at the agency for these ICS threats. I feel pretty confident in saying they don't know either. Like, it, there's nobody that's got really good visibility onto these industrial threats. So why and what does that mean for you? All right, set the base of the discussion. Um, and this is something you can apply to enterprise security as well, but it's a topic of collection. All right, so from an Intel piece, an Intel perspective, everything an intelligence analyst does is generally based off their collection. They get a requirement of I'm gonna go figure out what I actually wanna do, because they shouldn't just be making their own requirement. Somebody needs to give them something to do. Uh, from that requirement, they'll go figure out how to collect. What am I collecting? If you tell me that I really want to get into uh, industrial threats in the Middle East, and I'm looking at Wireshark in a Texas refinery, like that may not make sense, right? It's a mismatch of collection. So the first big topic is that applies to just about everything we see, where all of your networks, and let's just do a big abstraction of there's IT and there's ICS. Everybody in IT is, is uh, thinking to themselves, like, my job is more complex than just a giant IT category. Like, trust me, ICS feels the same way. Uh, but there's sort of a larger abstraction of these networks and those networks. Most of our insights to threats, cyber threats in general, most of them actually come from the private sector. It's been a really good job. Symantec, FireEye, McAfee, uh, Palo Alto Networks, these, these companies over the years have done a really, really good job of contributing knowledge around what happens in their customer networks. And so largely they deploy endpoint protection systems and firewalls and IDSs and everything else in these environments. And based off what happens here, they are able to centralize that data back and get some level of telemetry or data from those devices to help them understand intrusions, adversary activity against victims. And they centralize that across lots of different customers and they can come up with insights like, hey, uh, there's this APT29 that's targeting journalists and going after election-like infrastructure. They can say that because it's happening in the victim networks. I think a lot of people too much, put too much reliance on, well, the government knows it too. Well, not really. The government does some cool things, and, I, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of fun stuff happens over there, but all the best intel in the world is happening in your networks. So all the security vendors usually want to get at that data to be able to make some sort of analysis about it. That would be cyber threat intel. Intel is not an indicator feed. If somebody tries to tell you that intel is an indicator feed and you can pay a lot of money for it, like that's just because they think very little of you as a person. Uh, Intel is analysis of these threats. <coughs> the problem in industrial is we've never really had that in these industrial networks. Never had the internet connected IDSs and EDR and all this other stuff. Actually, most of that has not been in place at all. So we've had this giant gap on industrial. And it's interesting because people still want to talk about industrial security. The DHS comes out every year and says, here's the metrics of all the attacks we see in industrial environments. And folks put big value on the numbers, They're like, wow, 250 attacks in the energy sector. But then you actually dig into the metrics and they say, oh yeah, that was in the enterprise networks. We don't actually see in the ICS networks. You're like, okay, well, what you do see, what is the attack vector? How are these things happening so we can defend better? And every year, the number one attack vector for all of the industrial attacks that were released by DHS ICS CERT was unknown. <laughs> the literal number one attack vector was, we have no idea how that happened. Which I would position, if that's the actual answer, we're probably not moving forward with our security. Uh, we're largely taking a guess. The idea traditionally was, well, these ICS, or these industrial control system networks that run power, fuel, manufacturing, literally everything, uh, like pretty much everything outside of banks and insurers are industrial companies, and they just may not understand that. I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough to be able to do a bunch of board meetings these days. That's what happens is you're like a technical practitioner, and then you run a company, and they're like, oh, you should talk to the board. I'm like, that's a bad idea. And um, getting up at these board meetings, they're like, oh, yeah, well, what are you doing for like the SCADA security strategy or your 
operations security strategy or DCS security strategy, whatever term you want to call it, what are you doing for your industrial stuff? And it'll be like a power company, they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, you know, SCADA, they're like, nope, never heard of it. I'm like, oh shit. Uh, it's like the stuff that generates money for you. And they're like, oh yeah, no, we're doing a lot of stuff over in this network here because all of the connections come through IT. I'm like, that's not true. There's so all these connections to vendors and maintenance and ops and everything else. So. One of the topics, so second topic, I'm kind of ADD, we'll go off on to in a second, is largely the industrial security strategy of most companies has been to copy and paste the enterprise security strategy into the industrial environments. But it's against completely different threats on completely different equipment with completely different mission. So I'd position to you that you need different technology, people, and process as it relates to an entirely different landscape. But anyways, so uh, back here in this like little makeshift cloud, uh, the vendors effectively had good insight into IT but nothing in industrial. So the only thing we ever heard of were like the big words that you can't go through a security conference without hearing at least once. Uh, I'm not even gonna say it and grace it, but you get like the, the big word that everyone says and they're like, wow, that was the ICS attack. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, well, that was the one. And there's a lot of stuff going on. But if you think about it, a lot of the security companies historically have been anti-malware companies. Right? So if it's not malware, it's not their threats. But a lot of the stuff we're seeing in industrial networks is effectively adversaries, humans, threats, that are taking advantage of native functionality and features. If I can click the button to open the circuit breaker to take down the power line anyways, why do I need to put malware on there to do it? I can just do that because that's native functionality on the system. Um, so we started seeing more and more as teams started coming out. When I, when I built that mission in the agency, um, I remember uh, leadership effectively saying, that's stupid. Like, why? Like, well, there's no such thing as industrial specific threats. Like, okay, I, I think there are. Like, I think if you're any good team around the world, at some point you think about targeting industrial because it's a giant political target. Outside of all the economic and intellectual property for like pharmaceutical companies or manufacturing companies and outside of all of that, it scares politicians. So if you're gonna have an impact in this whatever domain we wanna call it, scaring the hell out of a congressman is pretty good influence. Um, so going after those sites would be pretty useful. Anyways, long story short, we found a ton of threats and it kind of uh, woke people up to that. And now from, I would say from the year 2000, uh, 2010, no, I'd say 2009, most people weren't really tracking industrial threats at all. Anybody remember the big APT1 report? Right, so FireEye, Mandy, and at the time, Kevin Mandy released this APT1 report, and it was a really good report on looking at Chinese-based operations in the US. And I remember talking to some of the folks there and said, well, did you look, you said it targeted an energy company, did it make it into the manufacturer, or did it make it into the industrial networks? And they're like, we don't know. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know? Like, well, we saw some activity going to those networks, but we didn't have authorization to go into the plants and we didn't have the skill sets to do it anyways, so we just let it go. And so I would position to you that most of the history of industrial threats, especially in like the first half of the decade, or the first decade there in the uh, turn of the century was just we didn't look. We weren't actually poking around to see that a lot of the campaigns and threats we'd heard about actually were doing stuff on industrial, we just didn't know. And then Stuxnet came out, yeah, there's that word. Eh, can't, can't even get around it. And everyone said, oh, SCADA. Let's talk about SCADA. Well, SCADA is one type of industrial environment. It's just one type of application in that industrial environment. There's way more out there than SCADA. But everybody overnight became a SCADA expert. It was really interesting to see. And, uh, but I do like the interest. And then what effectively happened is we started hearing about Dragonfly, we started hearing about uh, Sandworm, started hearing about these threats targeting environments. Really good work done by Symantec about Dragonfly, really good work done by iSight around Sandworm, and started revealing that there are threats that were targeting these entities. Uh, and then 2016, 2015, um, I think we started seeing a, a much bigger spike, and that leads to that upper trend, uh, for a couple of events. One, I'm gonna be super arrogant for a second, and I'm sure all of you 
you're like, oh my God, it's a keynote. Of course, he's going to be arrogant. But um, my almost my entire team left in 2015 to just go do it in the private sector. We're like, screw it, bureaucracy and the government's not helping us. No offense to the government audience here in largely San Antonio. Uh, we were like, we're not, we're just done with this bureaucracy crap. Let's just go do everything we were doing anyways, but in the private sector because it's all their data anyways. And so we started finding a bunch more threats. We saw this hockey stick-like moment where there's now 10 different targeted threats um, that are targeting industrial consistently, specifically industrial networks, not just the enterprise network of an energy company. 2015, we also saw the Ukraine attack. It was the first time in history a um, a cyber attack took down a portion of a power grid. So I got to lead up a portion of that investigation and, and it was really interesting because it wasn't fancy. Uh, effectively, you have distribution sites, you have control centers, and they're connected up. And in a power grid, you'll have generation, transmission, distribution. Generation, heart, pumping, transmission, arteries, large amounts of electricity, distribution, veins, smaller local towns. Got it, you're experts now. All right, so uh, from Ukraine, it was just distribution focused. Didn't go after any of the big transmission sites. And all of the countries around the world who've been doing anything in industrial security for power grids had largely been focusing on transmission and generation, rightfully so. There's two big reasons for that. One, if you're gonna take down a country, you'd have to go after transmission and generation. It's a lot of power. And by the way, there isn't one grid. There's technically five, but there's three inside the continental United States, East Coast, West Coast, and Texas. You literally have your own grid. You could secede if you really wanted to. Uh, <laughs> and interestingly enough, it also generally runs across a lot of territory, so the federal side of the house gets involved in transmission, so they can put federal resources on the bulk electric system. But distribution doesn't get it all prioritized. So from a distribution perspective, targeting distribution was clever by the adversary. All they did is they broke into these companies, they compromised the IT networks, they used malware called Black Energy 3, which every security professional focused on. Look at Black Energy 3. Can we have indicators related to Black Energy 3? Can we look for Black Energy 3? Oh my gosh, do we have Black Energy 3 or not? It was like, stop. Black Energy 3 was an access tool. It could have been anything. It could have been an interpreter shell. I don't care. It was just a tool to get into the environment. Once they got into the environment, they moved over to starting using legitimate credentials and accounts, and then they went and used VPNs into the industrial side of the house, and they were there for six months learning the industrial operations before they actually did their attack, which was just using the native features of the machines to turn off electricity to around 67 substations. So around 225,000 customers lost power for six hours. So there's like a lot to unravel there. There was one company that even found Black Energy 3 in their networks and then removed it and still had the attack and they were still taken down because they focused on their malware problem and not their threat problem. But the other thing I'll note here that's really interesting from that attack to me is what's happened since. Uh, and I'll bring us up to speed in sort of the last couple years on these threats and I'll pause for questions and we'll go on to another topic. The, what's really interesting to me about this is a lot of folks have come out and positioned, well, pfft, six hour power outage, 225,000 people, that's not even a hurricane. That's so small, we're fine. And, and I'm usually a big fan of our infrastructure is far more resilient and reliable than anybody gives it credit for, and it's not gonna fall over flat because of phishing email. Like, I'm usually in that camp, but I'm not quite in the camp of, and we're okay. Like, I, there's some middle ground. You talk to a journalist, it's either it can't be done or we're all gonna die. And like, right in the middle has gotta be where we actually live, which is, yeah, where, where is effectively, you can do these attacks, and yes, it may not be world ending on some of the smaller ones, we can talk about larger, but the impact to the populace about having a foreign power take down their power for any amount of time had a larger impact than wattages and, and in terms of being uh, power loss. If you, I often get, so I went and, and testified in front of the Senate, which is another mistake uh, the government made, has allowed me to speak there. But I went and testified in front of the Senate and they asked me like, what is your worst case scenario? And they're expecting like, well, I would do this and this and this and I'd implant this and I'd blow up, you know, whatever. And I'm like, dude, my worst scenario is 30 minute power outage in DC. I'm like, what? I'm like, it wouldn't be impossible to do. It's like 
relatively obtainable by any decent adversary. The defenders can do their job, don't get me wrong, but eventually you could absolutely cause a 30 minute power outage in DC. And your populace would be scared out of their mind because you've told them about you know, giant apocalyptic events and they'll see this as a precursor and the constituents will pressure the elected officials and the elected officials will need to look hard on the electric industry and they'll take the regulations that we already have and crank them up to you know, level thousand and we will regulate ourselves out of an electric industry overnight. And they're like, oh shit, well yeah, that's a good one, right? Like, you know, just be careful. Uh, my fear is the fear. So there's this middle ground we gotta live in, but we gotta be careful of the fear. Anyways, the other thing that I noted in 2015 that I try to warn people on, we, Mike Asante and I wrote a paper on it. Um, it's available at SANS. So I teach the SANS classes as well. I wrote the instant response when I see a couple, uh, instant response for ICS class, see a couple of my students in the audience, and then the Intel class, if you ever see me again, hello. Um, the interesting thing that, I, that Mike and I pointed out in 2015 is it was one substation done differently. Across the 67 or so disconnected substations, they were all done where the adversary broke into the environment and used the native system against itself. And exactly one, they sent a disconnect command without being part of the system from the adversary side of the communication. So on the adversary side of the VPN, if you will, they sent a command that disconnected the substation. And what we wrote in our paper at the time was, this is really probably some foreshadowing to future events. I don't wanna say this is predictive, we're gonna get attacked again, but our assessment to the National Security Council and the electric community was we think another one's coming. And the reason we said that was, there's no reason if you've got a reliable attack to just do something extra. There was a portion of my career, a small portion, I got to be on the offense the US government doing stuff against foreign infrastructure and never in my day was I like, woo, we're bored. Let's create something weird so when Kaspersky finds us, they'll be impressed. Like that's not, <laughs> like that's not how an offensive team thinks. Uh, the idea was let's get on with our mission because your adversary has PowerPoint and management too. Right, they gotta get on with their day, they're people. Kids gotta get picked up after daycare, whether you're an asshole adversary or a cool defender. So when we looked at the attack, we said something was different, one thing was different that looks like testing. Because it's not like you standing up a PLC in your basement to play with is representative of an electric power grid. Not a lot of opportunities to test and train. So we said, we think something else is coming. And in 2016, that something else came. It was called Crash Override. ESA also published a report on it called an Destroyer. Um, we didn't coordinate. Sometimes coordination hurts with naming things. Um, and we looked at it. And effectively what happened in Ukraine 2016 was it was again a control center, but it was just one transmission level substation. And they put this crash override malware onto a system that could speak to the substation. And all it did was use completely legitimate native protocols, exactly what we saw in 2015 from that one, and it disconnected the substation. And then it stuck it in a just constant disconnect loop. So if you try to reconnect it, you couldn't. And the operators had to go back to what's known as manual control. They had to drive out there and do it themselves. This didn't scare a lot of people because it was only one hour. It didn't scare a lot of the public. It scared everybody in the electric industry for a couple reasons. One, that one substation compared to the 67 distribution stations was three times the power loss of all the first attack. Because transmission's a lot bigger than distribution. The second thing is you can't patch that away. Right, wrong, and different, a lot of infosec sometimes comes down to did you patch it or not. There's more to it, I grant you. So I'm sure some of you enterprise security people do more than just patch things. The ICS security guy would claim that you don't. We'll see, who knows, who knows, I'm sure you do. <laughs> and, and in ICS security, we find that the patches don't really do much at all. We, Dragos released a report at the beginning of this year that looked at all of the 2017 vulnerabilities released by the DHS, all of the public ICS vulnerabilities. We found that 64% of all of them introduced zero risk. In other words, if you patched it, you introduce more risk to the process by going out and doing it than just ignoring it. Because 64% of them didn't do anything. It was like, hey, if you're on this human machine interface and you can talk to that PLC and you click this link, it'll give you root permissions on the PLC. 
Like that's entirely the job of the system anyways, is I have root permissions on that. I don't need an exploit to do that. So it's like stunt hacking stuff that has nothing to do with the risk of industrial. Anyways, the, what scares everybody about this is ICS malware, really potent ICS malware is not really scalable. There's nothing you can actually just click, you know, uh, one piece of malware and throw it into a different environment and be done because we're talking about physical systems. There's physics involved in this. There's integration. The substation here in San Antonio is different than the substation in Austin. But they abstracted it out to a network element of using native protocols, which makes Crash Override 100% scalable across every piece of electric transmission and environment for all of Europe, all of the Middle East, most of Asia, and parts of uh, Australia. That sucks, <laughs> like that's just, there's no patching it, it gets on your system, you run it, you're good to go. Now there's the whole adversary of operation of putting it in place, Okay, there's the human element to that. I hate when people are like, well, can we detect that malware or not? Well, can you detect all the different steps that go into it is what you should be looking at. Um, but it won't work in the US without at least one day of tailoring by the adversary, so you know, good, good job. Um, so it would take at least one day to sub in a different protocol. Um, and then in 2017, we saw something even worse than that. And this is where I'll, I'll in, capture this comment, wrap up the first topic, ask questions, and introduce the second topic. What we saw in 2017 was the first time a cyber attack targeted human life. So this to me is one of the things that I love about ICS security is that it's black and white. When I worked at the agency, everything's gray. Well, what do you mean you broke into Belgian telecom? Well, I don't know, there's like terrorists there, it's kind of gray. Well, the Belgian doesn't think so, the US doesn't think so, but you can argue about it, and it's kind of gray. In industrial security, if you're in somebody else's civilian industrial infrastructure, you can hurt people. You're wrong, you shouldn't be there. There's no value to be there for you. It's black and white. Whoever's in that network, there is no like, yeah, but it's us. No, screw you, get out. We've even had, I uh, won't reveal the person's name, senior government official uh, reach out to me and be like, well, what happens if you guys find us because you do global operations? I'm like, then I report on it because you're an asshole. Like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a weird world to be in. Anyway, so 2017 what happened is a petrochemical facility in Saudi Arabia experienced an attack. Eh, kind of close enough, there we go. You may have read the news and heard it was Iran that attacked Saudi Aramco. Both of those statements are incorrect. Saudi Aramco wasn't the victim, Iran wasn't the adversary. So don't trust everything in the media about ICS. All right, so in July, or excuse me, in June, the attack happened, and the first time it happened, the adversaries targeted what's known as a safety instrumented system. A safety instrumented system is only put in place to protect human life. If it's to protect equipment, it's called uh, protection equipment, it's protecting equipment. But if you're protecting human life, you put a safety instrument in system, and each one is specifically configured to that industrial process, because it's trying to bring that industrial process to a stop safely if anything bad ever happens. The adversary specifically broke into this environment, they compromised a VPN um, that was getting into the industrial environment, moved over into the environment, did lateral movement across a human machine interface over to an engineering workstation down to where they could speak to the SIS. They actually did that in 2014. So this is, some of this is new information, surprise. Anyway, so 2014, uh, they compromised that facility. They broke in, they figured out what SIS was in place, and they left. And then in 2017, they came back. Now, we could say that it took them three years to develop their capability, but we don't know that. It could have just been they developed a capability and then waited until they actually wanted to use it. But given the honestly kind of sloppy operation that we saw at the end, it kind of looks like that actually just took them that long to make their capability. They deployed a capability that we called Trisis. And effectively, all it did was compromise the safety system in a way that wouldn't trip it, or was supposed to, where it wouldn't trip it, and it would just remove the safety features from the safety system. If you exploit or attack a safety system, it'll drop. It detects something weird, and it crashes. And that's its job, it's supposed to do that. When it crashes, it brings everything in the plant down to a safe environment and says, hey, something's going on. The whole job is to be this tripwire that catches everything and brings everything to safety. 
but the effect of the attack was supposed to remove that safety function and leave the system running so that they could follow up with another attack on another part of the plant, which we saw them prepare, so they were going to do it, which would allow them to kill people in that plant. The only reason to go after the safety system was to literally kill people in that plant. They messed up a very small component of the malware. I think this is being recorded, I don't want to get into it, but um, be like, hey, here's your feedback. I thought you screwed up your attack. Anyways, but they messed up one small thing that tripped the safety system instead. That was in June. Plant goes down. Operators get involved and said, huh, something's weird here. What is it? And they reached out to a vendor, um, an, an ICS vendor, and the vendor told them, well, it's probably just a misconfiguration of your safety system. Our safety systems are just, they're awesome. No way anything else could happen. And one engineer even asked them, like, what about cyber? And they're like, nah, not on a safety system. These are safety systems. You can't do anything cyber related to it. They said, okay. <laughs> so they went back into operation. Then in July, or excuse me, in August, rather, it happened again. Adversary tailored the attack to try something different and still crashed the system. This time they're like, look, something's wrong. Called the vendor up again. They got different people at the vendor that took a much more mature position and said, maybe there's something here. And they called in Saudi Aramco to do the incident response. That's how Saudi Aramco got dragged into the story in the media. They weren't the victim. They were the heroes of the story. They're the ones that actually went and did the incident response. They found the malware. They did the incident response. They tied it all up, made a nice report on it internally. It was awesome. And they said, yeah, here's this capability and it's malicious and it's trying to, trying to hurt people. And they didn't dive completely into the malware, but they saw that it was malicious. At that time, they then, um, their management, and this is a, it's no fault to the vendor that I'm about to name. They did a good job, but it's a, a statement that I'm gonna make for everybody in here. Their management didn't really have a lot of faith in the Aramco instant responders. They said, well, you guys couldn't have possibly done a good job. You're our people. We need to call in the experts. Um, so they called in FireEye, and I, I like FireEye plenty, um, but Saudi Ramco did the instant response. FireEye ended up getting to publish a report about it, and they couldn't, and, and they, for whatever, I don't know the background of it, they didn't um, call out the Saudi Ramco piece, but it really came down to Saudi Ramco not trusting their people. And it was the same report, same kind of insight, same discovery, and they could have got ahead of it without any media or anything else involved. Uh, my firm ended up having the malware because uh, we tracked the threat as Xenotime. Everybody makes up made up names, but ours are based off industrial minerals. Get it? Clever. Anyways, um, we tracked them as Xenotime. One of the reasons we knew about this is it wasn't just that one site. We were actually tracking six different sites, six different environments that this adversary was going after. Um, it later leaked to the media through the DHS, thanks to DHS. That, uh, one of the sites was here in the US. Like this isn't like a Saudi issue. There's a threat out there that is purposely trying to kill people and is targeting safety systems uh, and industrial environments to do so and it's a widespread threat and they're fairly sophisticated. So let's abstract this. Go back to that original topic. Earlier we lived in this I don't know phase because I'm not looking. Now we're in this, oh this is really interesting stuff. But I think we're also gonna be playing catch up of hey, here's something that happened in 2014 we just didn't see yet. So for everybody in the community, it's gonna look like there's this hockey stick moment of all these industrial threats that came out of nowhere. And in reality, there are more aggressive and more industrial threats than we've ever seen before, but there are also a lot of the previous threats we're just now catching up on that have been going around this environment and community for a while. And there's a lot of lessons that we should be capturing out of this because all of your standards and regulations and insights so far into industrial security have been based off of, I don't know. And so they have been based off industrial security, or excuse me, enterprise security best practices. The top four things that I see on every checklist for industrial sites to do are 100% IT things that could also get them hurt. Like make sure you have 100% patch rate, like ooh God, please don't do that, you're going to kill somebody. Uh, and it goes all the way down to you should encrypt your ICS network data. Why would I do that? Well you can stop uh, man in the middle attacks. Like, so? Like, it's literally function that's there. What do you mean I can stop? I, I lose all visibility into my data if I encrypt it. 
and I'm stopping one archaic pen tester trick that we've never actually seen used by an adversary here for any purpose. And that's the other piece, that we see a lot of pen tester tricks get codified into best practices. Well, if I can drive up to your facility and hook up to Bluetooth, well, I can break that wind turbine. Like, great. That's physical security. Go do that, it matters. But when the Russians are paratrooping into your substation to connect up to Bluetooth, I want you to call the government, all right, and not worry about your standards. <laughs> FBI on speed dial. The FBI on speed dial. All right, they'll come and tell you about InfraGuard and all the good things that are going around in the community. So, here's the big topic that I introduced. We have had a significant lack of collection for all industrial security for the last f ever. We're starting to see things, so we should adapt off of that and make sure that we start catching up. One of my favorite things about Intel is its ground truth. I can see all your latest cool DEF CON, Black Hat, whatever research talks, and they're cool. I think the research community does a lot of good work to help move the bar, and that's useful. But there's a lot of stuff and it's overbearing to an asset owner, an operator who's running infrastructure to be told of all these cool hacks. It's way better to be able to walk in and go, here's what actually happened. Here's what you actually could have done to do security. There's a certain ground truth reality to good intel. So that's what, what the first big topic is. All right, so before I move on to the second big topic of what you can do about all this, any questions on, hey, we're not looking at stuff, but we're starting to, so be careful and don't freak out. This is not gonna be interactive at all. You are going to just make me stand here and jump into the next topic, sir. So was there any forum previous to that where people could have collaborated, maybe they didn't? Yeah, so there, there's always been good forums for collaboration. Uh, a lot of the idea around ISACs and like building collaboration came from critical infrastructure, uh, infrastructure community. PDD 63, 1998, Bill Clinton said, thou shalt go talk. Um, I'm sure they talked about it before then too, that's the first time I remember it. And uh, that created your information sharing and analysis centers. But we have to be careful here, what I really get excited about when I see forums to share, InfraGuard, uh, ISACs, some of the ISALs now, I've not seen one good ISAL yet, maybe there's somebody in the uh, audience that I'm gonna pretend it's your ISAL, but really I don't think any ISALs are good right now. Um, ISACs and um, forums, they're all fine to show up and talk to, but what everyone tries to treat them as is give me the intel. Show me the thing that I should do. And the problem is none of those forums should do that. And so instead I see it even being a little misleading when some ISACs want to be the cool, sexy intel provider, and so they buy like the FS ISACs uh, feed. So the um, oil and gas ISAC for a while was just buying the threat intel feed, which those words don't really go together, but the feed of indicators related to financial sector and repackaging it for the oil and gas sector. I'm not a real big fan of indicators at all used like detection. They're good for forensics and scope but for detection, but I hope we can all agree that the things that the financial sector are dragging out for indicators definitely shouldn't be copy and pasted in oil and gas. So the forums exist, but they're there to go learn the other POCs at other companies and talk about what are you doing to make the case for security in your company. They're not for, hey, show up so I can brief the latest thing so I can understand the coolest threat. That's the companies that are actually doing the work or the companies that are going through the incidents. They're the ones that have it and everybody's trying to get to it. I really like the FBI and DHS, but I used to get really tired of having to go into a top secret briefing to see my own reports brief back to me, so I stopped going. They're not there for that, but going to the FBI meeting where I got to meet all of the other people in the community and talk about the best practices they were seeing, that was really useful. So you gotta be careful in how we use those forms. Yeah, great question. Anything else? Yes? How much visibility did co companies have into their ICS systems before anyway? They didn't. So the question was, how much visibility did, did folks really have into the industrial networks anyways? And for the most part, they don't. There, I would say, I'm gonna make up numbers, but this is based off of my own observations, so it's anecdotal. Um, it's a big word for a kid from Alabama. Um, I would say that there's like your top 30% who are doing really cool stuff, and they're in infrastructure companies, and they're doing it way better than any IT company. They're just doing awesome stuff. Then there's like everybody else, 40 to 50 percent, that they're just doing what they can to get by, 
and they might be adopting some of the minimum kind of best practices because they're keeping up with regulation a lot of times too. And then there's kind of like your last 20% that are just, they're not doing anything. RDP right to the machine. Yep, RDP right to the generator, yeah, all sorts of interesting things. <coughs> so there's also a balance I gotta take there. Since I've said like not everybody's perfect, I do wanna line up that just because you have access to a power plant doesn't mean you can make the lights blink. There's a big difference in IT world, I get access, I get root, I'm the king or queen, or both, I don't know, spectrum. Um, but <laughs> in ICS, access is just step one. So there's a paper I wrote titled the ICS Cyber Kill Chain. Yeah, Cyber Kill Chain. Anyways, it's a useful abstraction. Um, and I wrote it over at SANS with Mike Asante to talk about how these attacks occur. And all the stuff that people are worried about, we would just normally put that as phase one, and then your operation can start into industrial. So people need to be doing more. Most of the plants I go to, they say, oh, we've segmented off that magical ICS thing, and we have a data diode, and we're good. And like, that's not even close to true or real. Usually, you're, you, IT, OT convergence is the topic people are talking about in ICS, of like, we're converging between information technology and operation technology, and that's, no offense to anybody, that's stupid. That happened well over a decade ago. IT, OT convergence happened. There's Windows-based HMIs with cloud access. Get past it and move towards real security instead of these debates about convergence. All right, any other questions? Yes? Yeah, NERC and FERC. FERC, federal regulation that says, come on, power guys, keep up. Uh, NERC, the action arm, it's a, technically it's not a government agency, but it's one of the few private sector nonprofits that has the ability to levy fines on behalf of a federal agency. One of the big misnomers in the entire community is that electric grid providers are just so far behind and they're just barely keeping up with this. And the reality is a lot of the NERC SIP standards don't actually apply to security. And so they're usually, the power companies are making big investments in security, but they don't wanna talk about it out loud because it actually works against them. Where they say, hey, we're doing really cool security so we can protect you and your local power. And then they have to have a communications with their local people on, yeah, of course there's cyber threats. And then it just, it's a media nightmare. So they usually do a lot more than people realize. They just don't talk about it because it causes them pain points. But the NERC SIP standards um, have been in place for well over a decade now. And the, every three years, new standards come out of thou shalt do this. And if you don't, it's like a million dollars a day for fines. So people pay attention. Uh, the problem is, now let me say something nice about NERC real quick. So NERC SIP, I would say absolutely our power grid is more reliable and resilient and defensible today than it was a decade ago, largely because of the work of the power industry to apply to NERC SIP standards. However, I think we've run out of common sense NERC SIP standards, and so now they're just making shit up. <laughs> and like that was, I try to say it as nice as possible, but I went in front of the Senate specifically for that and said, hey, FERC, Let's go to more programmatic security rather than performance-based. Performance-based is, do you have this percentage of patches deployed? Programmatic is, do you have a patch management like program to do right fit for your company? So a lot of the, the companies don't innovate for fear that the next set of regulations will actually make them not be able to do whatever they just invested in. So I think NERC SIP, good job. Pat everybody in the back, good job everybody, now please stop. Uh, and so my recommendation was pause for three years, no new regulations for three years, and then check to see what the industry is doing because we've learned a lot of major attacks over the last couple of years, and let's put regulations in place against those to, to move the needle forward based off of whatever the power companies say are a best practice. The problem I found is then I got calls from the FERC commissioner saying, look, FERC commissioners only ever put in place for like three years. So you're asking me to get a nominated for this position and then do nothing for three years. And my 
quip was, yeah, that's great, good job. You get free paycheck to just shut up for three years. Like, you should be happy about that, but I understand. All right, so what I said instead was the programmatic one of totally get it. You want to do something because you want to help the community. Make it something that's helpful by being vague enough to allow people to innovate within the bubble to which you want. Um, but they're doing things now, like there's one that's particularly scary, which they, FERC has mandated a discussion, so it'll be a discussion first, and then it goes into regulation of any successful compromise or attempted compromise of an industrial environment has to be reported to the DHS and FERC. That's stupid. They would have to hire so many people just of the onslaught of attempts. Like any scan against your firewall, you'd have to then put up. Also, it should never go to the DHS. I like the DHS, got a lot of friends there. I'm sure somebody's in the audience who's like, I'm DHS, you're adorable. But <laughs> DHS doesn't have authority over the power grid. It should be FERC, and it should go through the EISAC, who actually does a lot of good work for NERC, and it can keep it abstracted, because what happens in every incident that gets reported is DHS wants to show up and go, we do free pen desks, we're here, we're helping, and it's great, and I love you, and it's awesome, but now is not the time. Like, they're going through in an incident, come back in a year, and let's talk about it. So getting data, basically the argument comes down to this. You should not be asking for data that you can't use that is going to be strenuous on the companies to produce. And so it just doesn't make sense right now. Does that answer your question enough? Yeah, perfect. Anybody else I think you had something? Yeah. And I'm also okay not getting into the next topic for Q&A. Q&A is good, the next topic, boring anyways. All right, yeah, go ahead. To cycle back to the first part of uh, the first point you're making, the, the threat intel infrastructure doesn't exist in ICS the way it does for IT. Oh, I think it, yeah, it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ask your question, then so I'll. What, what is the solution? How do we, how do we uh, create multiple vendors that want to create products that compete against each other that can make this? Uh, oh, man. He asked a PhD-like question here. Uh, one was, the Intel infrastructure doesn't exist today, so what do we do? Two was, how do we create an economy for it? It's basically what you asked. Um, so number one, there are companies that do it. Selfishly, Dragos does it. There, there's your pitch. Look at that. Look at that. That was that was a vendor pitch. Anyways, but um, Dragos, I think, is doing some cool shit. But there's others. Eyesight, no, no. Eyesight uh, has like some ICS Intel stuff. Um, I've seen good reporting from Symantec, and you know, ESIT picks up something every now and then. So there's like vendors who are dabbling, and and I would say the reason that I like. Tragos, outside of being obviously biased, is we only do industrial, so we can focus. For everybody else, it seems to be a tack on of, if you're interested in ICS, we have an answer for it. And I'm not trying to downplay those researchers, but I would like to see a larger economy of, let's build this up, because industrial is where all your risk is. This is why I told the various boards was, look at your security budget for IT, look at your security budget for OT security, or less, but look at the risk in your company of where you actually generate money. You're mismatched in your risk to where you're spending money. Doesn't make sense. So by voting with dollars, people do create an economy, but I don't think it's gonna be successful right now anyways, and the concern I have is DHS, DOE, and DOD, and FBI are all trying so hard to do something for the community, they're actually competing with private sector trying to build up the community. It doesn't make any sense, but as an example, um, and this isn't, my talk wasn't designed just like dash DHS, but like DHS says that you can call them for a free instant response but they don't actually have ICS people to do the answer response anyways. But there's multiple customers that we've talked to that are like, should I cancel the contract with you? Because DHS says they can do it for free. And I'm like, that's not a good idea. Um, have it with somebody, don't rely on, we're here from the government, we're here to help you. Talk to them too, but it shouldn't be an either or. But the problem is, as government officials try to get people onto the programs, they make claims like, call us during an incident, which should be said, call us during or a little bit after the incident to give you some perspective on what's going on in the national scene after you yourself are on tap for the incident. But there's never that comma and so forth. And so it's not that anybody's misleading anybody on purpose, it's just the message is getting lost. Or if I tell you, and I've, like I've had senior DHS officials that are like, we don't wanna be doing that, how do I, uh, why is this bad? Or more importantly, how do I fix it? And I'll ask them like, how are you measuring your people? And they're like, what? I'm like, do you have a metric anywhere in your organization on how many people get signed up for clearances? And they're like, well, yeah. I'm like, well, there 
you go. You just incentivize somebody in your own organization to run the number up of the number of clearances, so their incentive is to go to every company and say, if you only had a clearance, I could tell you, and that's part of your mismanagement of how you're communicating. So how you do management of people with how you measure their success drives what they do, which can give a completely different output than you want, and the government has problems on that right now. The other piece is DHS, and I hate that this is recorded because I'm gonna get a phone call after this. DHS and DOE hate each other right now. They're in like open war with each other. Um, mention the word Caesar and mention the word hurt, and they'll both kill you. And then FBI and DOD are off in the corner going, but I wanna be involved too, and then it's just this mess. Um, so there's way more to be figured out there, but they need to figure it out, and when they figure it out, they should also highlight what the portion of the private sector is supposed to do. Because a lot of people are confused. Like I've, I've long said, DHS, if you honestly think you can do instant response around the community and just take the problem, then do it. If you honestly solve it, do it. But if you just call us to subcontract to us, stop telling people that you can do it. And so it's it's this balance. Yeah. Oh man, I'm going to drink after this one. What else? There's like this side of the audience. Yeah. Uh, what about tooling? Tools, yeah, just good question. Tools, you should definitely look at tools, but remember there's people in process, and I get in these arguments, like now that I'm a dirty vendor, I get in these arguments with myself on, like I wanna tell people to go use my tool because it can help people, and then I'm like, ah, that's not, you know, like what are they doing? Well, maybe they could do like open source, like security on here or something, I'm like, but well, you're not actually gonna manage that at scale, and like you actually need support contracts, and it's, it's like this, everybody grows up to be a vendor thing is like awful, and you just like slit your wrist a little, and you're like, God dang it, but, but honestly, the reality is you have to do all three, and it has to be with a strategy. And I think if you start with any one of those without defining your three to five year strategy at the beginning, you're just gonna be misplaced. Like, I, I like selling stuff because I like running a company, but I'll get customers that come to us that go, what should we be doing and what does your tool do? And my response is, you shouldn't ask me those questions. You should tell me what you wanna do and measure my tool against what you wanna do, and if it can help you, great. And make sure you also have the people in process to put in place. If you're gonna buy a tool, you have to spend resources on these things too. Um, but I do think the idea that you have to have technology is important, and the idea that everything can be done in open source is just silly, and open source is a product too. Everyone's like, open source, let's support our open source community. I'm like, tell me Elastic didn't just IPO for multi-billions of dollars. Like, open source is a product. Just figure out what works for you and push back on the BS marketing claims that effectively are snake oil. Uh, somebody else had it, yeah. So I appreciate that you pointed out the problem of fear. Uh, what is being done or should be done to help inform the public and policymakers in that thing? Everybody that is a security practitioner in this room and around the community, educate yourself on some aspect of industrial infrastructure. You live and work with it, period. Like, I don't care what you do in your job, you depend on your industrial infrastructure, your local power, water, everything. Some point, someone's gonna be freaking out off something they saw in the news, and you should be able to raise your hand and be like, look, I'm not an expert, but a phishing email to the power company doesn't take down the grid. Like, those simple, subtle things can change the entire narrative. Uh, the gas pipeline explosions in Massachusetts. Uh, somebody went online and said, I think it's a cyber attack. And I like the person normally, but I thought that was very irresponsible. It's an ongoing event. There's no possible way for anybody to know. And then I looked at it, and from a cyber perspective, it didn't even make sense because of the engineering of what was that site. But I just went out and said publicly, hey, guys, calm down. Could be anything. Your, we don't know if it wasn't a cyber attack is no more eloquent than we don't know if it was a flying fish. Like, it, you, the absence of data does not make data in this case. So. The idea of just being that technical expert in the room, you may not be a technical expert, but you're the technical expert in that room, just to calm people down is incredibly important, because if it is a cyber attack, then guess what? Uh, go bags, and it's gonna be a marathon, and there's gonna be a lot of work to be done, and people don't need to be riled up before the event, and they're just gonna be misguided. So the best thing is that. Now what do I do? I take a whiteboard like this, and I go donate my time to congressional staffers. Uh, probably once every month or two, I'll go down to the Senate and, and the Hill, and I'll meet with the staffers, and I'm like, hey, you're on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and they're like, yeah. I'm like, do you know how the power grid works? And they're like, no. I'm like, okay. 
it. I'm like, here's transmission, here's distribution, and, and draw it out. And you'd be surprised, I mean, everybody in this room that's ever been a technologist understands that you're put in positions that you're not the expert on, and it's really important to realize that they're not assholes, they're not jerks, it's not their problem, they were put there for a reason, but you can designate your time to go tell them how these things work, and just a little bit of that time spent can replace a lot of that fear stuff later on. That constantly educating is important, and they're waving at me trying to tell me that I'm done. All right, so with that, uh, thank you for your time, and uh, go protect infrastructure if you're not, go learn about it. And then if you want some extra resources uh, on my blog, robertandlee.org, there's a blog, and about six posts down, there's a getting started in ICS security, and there's like 30 or 40 links of free resources and free training and videos and everything else to go learn about industrial security and, and beef up your skills. With that... Yeah, you can take a class with me directly at SANS too, but that's free. Otherwise, feel free to pay and come see me at SANS too. Um, I think it's better for the five days of this. Aren't you excited about five full days? But um, yeah, the free resource too, so thanks. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you, Robert. Everybody uh, stay seated if you wanna see who won the two prizes. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Robert. Have a safe trip home.